Hi, welcome to the anatomy series and then I'm going to continue with the theme on discs because I talked about discs um, in an earlier uh, video and people have asked me some questions. I thought I just want to elaborate a little bit more on disc pathology. If you think about the disc and we've got 23 discs located within the whole vertebral column, then they are remarkable because there is a water component which as we get older it almost uh, changes to almost like a gel-like consistency. So rather than it being like a true water in the operative word, it's more of a, of like a, like a paste within like a tube of toothpaste. So it's like a, like a thickened sort of gel. And as we get older, no doubt that gel or the water type of fluid will deteriorate. And if you think about a disc, when we are born, then there is a lot of water content within. If we were to scan most discs on the younger patient, then we would see that between each vertebra there is a disc and within the disc it's very white on appearance because it contains a lot of water and even fat. And as we get older you might notice the distance between each of the vertebra gets less because the disc is now dehydrated. So they might call it triple D. So that means like it's a, a dehydrated or desiccated disc degeneration. So it goes through different processes. The problem is, as we get older, yes, the disc might deteriorate. And it might be due to the cells within, and we have millions of cells, like we have throughout the body, but within the disc in itself, each cell is known as the protoglycan aggregates. And remarkably, each cell is capable of absorbing 500 times its own body weight in water. And the disc normally rehydrates itself, typically when we are sleeping at night. If I was to lift up the vertebra, then this would be known as an end plate. So the disc will sit on the end plate, and then the end plates will rehydrate the disc and once you are sleeping. So what that means is when you wake up in the morning, potentially you are taller, and then as you go through the day, yeah, because gravity is working on you, you become slightly smaller. And it's been proven that men typically with a very large weight on their back, like, a, like if they're doing heavy squatting, if they were to measure before and after, they will be slightly shorter after they perform the, the power lifting exercise. But as we sleep, they then rehydrate, but only if the cells are present to actually allow the hydration process. Like most cells, they die, and unfortunately when cells die, they're not gonna regenerate, so it means that the disc, over time, naturally gets slightly drier, and probably that's why we, we get shorter as we get older. If we've got 23 discs, one millimeter per disc doesn't sound much, but if you times it by 23, let's say it's 25, 25 millimeters, that would be approximately one inch of loss of height, even though we're only losing one millimeter through each of the discs. When the disc actually goes through um, its process, when we bend forward, the fluid is going to migrate to the back, and then when we lean back, the fluid is going to migrate to the front, and vice versa, if we side bend, the fluid will shift one way, and vice versa to the other way. The worst position for discs in terms of injury is by flexion, rotation, and side bending. So if I was to bend, and then I flex and rotate and side bend to my left and I pick up a weight. If that weight is only 10 kilograms, yes, it might be 10 kilograms if I held it here, but for me to pick up the weight of 10 kilograms from the floor, especially being in a flexion, rotation, side bending position, it's going to place almost like 10 times as much to my disc. It's like a sponge of water. How would you get the water out? We would squeeze it. But if you want to really get the water out, you would squeeze it and you would wring it. And that's what's happening when we flex, side bend and rotate. We almost wring the disc. And if there's a weakness in the posterior wall, it's like the tire in a car, if there's a damage, yeah, the air or the, you might start to notice the underlying tread that's worn down, yeah, the metal work within the tire starts to show itself. So when the fluid starts to bulge because of a weakness, then it starts to push and then it starts to bulge. And then it has been known that it goes from a bulging and then it starts to protrude. And then from a protrusion, it starts to extrude. These are almost like similar processes, depending on what book you read. But most people would call it a prolapse disc. It doesn't slip. But if a fluid physically prolapses or herniates, 
and the fluid more than likely if it's central, depending where it's located. If it's central in the lumbar, it might contact the corda equina, which you definitely don't want that to happen because it can affect the function of a bowel and bladder. It also gives you what we call a saddle, sit on a saddle, you have a saddle anesthesia. And if you've got any dysfunction with bowel or bladder, it's a medical emergency. If it does contact the nerve that exits left or right, because to prevent it from going central, there's a ligament called the posterior longitudinal, but then if it does migrate through the ligament or change the shape into the equina, you will get those symptoms. But most of the time, because we bend to one side, the fluid is forced to the opposite side, for example, and then if that nerve root, which in this case is L4, L5, that's the exit nerve root of L5, if that fluid touches it, you will get perceived pain down that nerve root. Most of the time, discs settle down, but we don't tend to settle in a day or two or three. It could last maybe two to three months. If you still have pain, when I mean pain, everything hurts, coughing, sneezing, bending, sitting, lying, driving, anything, sleeping, then you probably find um, you'll be recommended to see the, the spinal surgeon and then you might end up doing what we call a, a micro discectomy where they'll go in through the lamina here and they will go down and then they remove part of the discs that's contacting the nerve root. If it's in the cervical spine, most of the time they'll go anteriorly, whereas in the lumbar, they tend to go in more posteriorly. So there's a little bit more information about pathology and anatomy of the intervertebral discs of the lumbar spine.